Welcome to Safe Work Australia's virtual seminar series. I'm delighted that we have four um, international experts to actually uh, assist us with our questions today. And I might start with Claudia. Would you mind introducing yourself to uh, Safe Work Australia's audience? Thank you. Um, I'm Claudia Moreno. I am from the School of Public Health, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am a professor there and I study circadian rhythms, sleep and some um, diseases among uh, shift workers and the work population in general. I'm Drew Dawson, I'm the director of the Appleton Institute at Central Queensland University and we spent about the last 20 years studying the effects of shift work and fatigue and in particular we're interested in the impact on accidents and injuries. I'm Hans van Dongen, I'm the director of the Sleep and Performance Research Center and a professor in the College of Medicine at Washington State University in Spokane in the United States. And my research focuses on sleep deprivation and circadian misalignment or, or what it is like to be a shift worker both in the lab and in the field. I'm Diane Boivin, I'm the director of the Center for Study and Treatment of Circadian Rhythms. Uh, Douglas Institute, McGill University in Montreal, and I'm studying the impact of circadian misalignment or disruption of the sleep-wake cycle on physiological rhythm and its application to shift work and also fatigue in the field for shift workers. So you can see we've got a very impressive lineup um, today to talk to, but Drew, before we begin into the questions, um, we're sitting here today at the 23rd International Symposium on Shift Work and Working Time um, at the lovely Uluru Centre that you've got us here to. Please, can you tell us what is this uh, symposium that you have arranged? Well, every two years or so, around about 100 to 120 people interested in the effects of shift work and treatments for shift work get together somewhere remote and exotic in the world. And the idea is to share with a group of academics, industry partners, regulators, what's the latest research in shift work and what we can do to minimise some of the problems that are, have been identified with shift work. Fantastic, that's great. So um, I might start uh, with you if I could, uh, Deanne. So for our audience, what uh, do you mean when you're talking about shift work and working time? Uh, you, you can answer that question on two levels. First, on the organisational level, it means group of workers who would alternate at a given position. And in, in France, France, we see travail posté mean that uh, you're at a position and you rotate group of workers. Uh, at the individual level, it means that you will work or, or end up working outside of the conventional weekday daytime hours. So, uh, and often it involves working during the nighttime period. And there's all sorts of organization, either it's a permanent on a, a regular night shift or it's rotating or the, y you can pretty much observe uh, a, a lot of organization of work uh, throughout various organization or have a regular shift being on call and so on so these are a typical work schedule thanks Ian. and and sort of hence this so the working times and shifts changed in the last 30 years or are they still the same well, no, they've changed in, in, in a variety of ways. I think, first of all, we've gone to an increasingly 24-7 oriented um, uh, economy and society. So the, the burden of uh, society on people to work at all hours of the day has increased um, uh, ever, uh, in, uh, is, is continues to increase ever and ever. Um, what I think is an interesting observation to make is that the way we, we try to manage those hours from a regulatory point of view is starting to change as well. And if we go back uh, to the beginning of the industri Industrial Revolution and, and, and all the way through the past century, we see there's an emphasis on regulating work time. In other words, putting maxima on how long you can work and putting minima on how long you should be off of work before you can rotate back into the workforce. Um, what we're seeing nowadays is a, is a tendency towards regulating not per the hours per se, but 
um, the level of fatigue that is associated with those hours and trying to put a cap on that level of fatigue so that you try to minimize the, the number of errors and, and, and risks that are associated with fatigue that enter the workplace. And that's a whole different kind of way of, of looking at the problem. It's much more dynamic. And in, instead of just counting hours, what you're trying to, to, to minimize is, is the, the effect of those hours as they have on, on performance and, and, and safety. Drew, um, have the working hours in Australia changed or are they, do they reflect international patterns? Well, a bit of both. Um, if you go back 20 to 30 years in Australia, you will have found that there was probably half a dozen rosters that were being worked around the country. Now there are literally thousands of different rosters. Um, for many Australians, the changes in the industrial landscape over the last couple of decades, and in particular the shift of negotiating shifts from uh, government, unions and the industrial court, to a situation now where it's typically negotiated between the employer and the employee at the local site means that we have a lot more people coming up with a lot of different rosters. The other interesting aspect of that is often people are designing and approving rosters with no expertise or knowledge about it and as a consequence sometimes short-term productivity gains for the company or income issues for employees tend to dominate the discussion rather than the health and safety aspects of it. Claudia, you, in your introduction you told us that one of your expertise areas was in circadian rhythms that um, uh, I wonder if you can, I understand that means our internal body clocks, I wonder if you can just unpack that a little bit more for our audience about what is our internal body clock and why is it important? Well, um, it is important because uh, we are diurnal, so we are supposed to sleep during uh, at night and be awake during the day. And the problem is, since the body was, uh, 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 since the body is uh, with has functions that uh, are predetermined by during the evolution as diurnal, this means if you inverse your work schedule, you have health problems. And it's important to understand that to do a task at three in the morning is not the same as a three in the afternoon. And this has consequences on performance, on health in general, and can also lead to a number of disease. And I think it's important to understand sleep uh, has to be uh, has to be according to the individual's needs. So some people really need to sleep more than others, and this is not possible when you have quick returns to work or you don't have days off enough to recover your sleep depth during the work week. I might actually open to all of you because I know you're all uh, researching in this area, but are there big differences between individuals? You know, or I, I, I've been hearing some uh, comments over the last few days at this meeting, but uh, perhaps uh, I could ask you to, to tell me about the individual differences. And are they, do they really matter? Well, uh, I think tremendously. Uh, however, it's a point where uh, we need more research because we understand very little the individual determinant that will make someone more vulnerable or resistant to shift work or sleep deprivation and uh, or of on developing long-term uh, medical consequences associated with shift work and i think uh, Hans has uh, very nice data also to share about resistance to sleep deprivation yeah, so, so we, one of the things we know is that people differ in how they respond to sleep loss and to working at odd hours um, in a systematic manner, in, in such a way that we even think it's a trait or possibly genetically determined to some extent. So that, that is that the sort of early morning person versus that's the that's an aspect of it. It's also some people are much more v um, resilient to just not sleeping as much as they really should. And some people are very vulnerable when they even lose about uh, 10 minutes of their normal sleep you immediately see the consequences. The interesting um, consequence of, of these differences is that with more flexible or more variable work schedules, there is in principle a better work schedule for every specific individual. And if we could just match the individual with the work schedule, 
shift work might not be as big a problem as it is today, but uh, because we, we, we put people in shifts that are not in alignment with their normal rhythms or not in alignment with the amount of sleep that they need, we then put them in a situation where shift work becomes a problem. And, and this pertains to night shifts, but it also pertains to early morning shifts. If you're a person, as going back to this morning, this eveningness uh, thing, if you're a person who is not a morning type and you're forced to work at early morning hours, that is as much shift work for your particular specific individual as working a night shift for somebody who's not an, uh, an evening type or an hour. So, Drew, what are the health consequences for um for uh, shift work for people if they're, they're not suited to it, or even if they are doing it um, for most of the time? Yeah, that's a very controversial area, Peter, and uh, and and I suspect this is not going to be a satisfying answer to a lot of people, which is. We have some preliminary data that shift work can cause health problems. Do we know the exact mechanism of action and what's happening at the cellular level? No, we don't. But I think you could probably think of the health effects into a couple of broad areas. We know that there are profound effects of shift work on food metabolism and how we process food and at certain times of the day, certain types of food that we shouldn't eat seem a lot more attractive than at others. Uh, I think we're also starting to see some good work showing that shift work, particularly where there's sleep loss, has impact on the immune system. So there's been quite good animal and human studies showing that you can be more susceptible to infection and you can take longer to recover when you've been a shift worker. But I think there's also a lot of social consequences that lead to potential health problems. So shift workers often eat worse food, they exercise less, traditionally they have smoked cigarettes more, have drunk alcohol more. So in many cases we see some of the short-term coping mechanisms for shift work also leading to long-term health consequences for shift workers. But again, this is a very new and emerging field and one that's going to require a few more years of careful research before we start raising the red flag. So to any of you, are there gender differences? Are men and women the same? Are there age differences? I'm thinking about times when I've had uh, adolescent children and uh, their sleep needs, so are there? Well, there is, the, the sex difference is very, a very important issue and uh, there were recent evidence showing that uh, the way the circadian systems or our body clock controls sleep differs between men and women and we know that there are uh, receptors to sexual hormones within the body uh, on the master clock. So receptors to testosterone, so progesterone. So could you just tell people what the master clock is? Oh, the master clock is a tiny little structure in the middle of the head at the base of the hypothalamus. We call it the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, you can throw that out during a party, it looks good. <laughs> but it's a tiny structure and it, it's like the conductor, the master component of the circadian system. So our system of body clocks, because we know there are several clocks now. But these are really sensitive to sex hormones and, and, the way, and, and control a, a lot of function and rhythms throughout the body and so important that we have to study the sex difference and there's some uh, evidence that women could be physiologically um, uh, more susceptible to being sleeping during the night and so we, we need to pursue this question about the influence of sex, of age, individual differences and uh, but that's a great question. Can I add something about uh, sex difference? Because I think it's not only sex differences, but it's also gender differences. What is the whole of women at home or men at home? And this means uh, if you have problems to be awake uh, at night, you also have problems to sleep during the day if you have to take care of children and to do domestic tasks. So this can also have an impact, an important impact on the uh, adaptation of these women at work. And it's a physiologic problem, but it's also a social problem. And hence, 
is there age differences? Yeah, age differences, especially in shift work, are, are very prominent, are very clearly um, and easy to find. Um, the general tendency is that as people get older, they have more difficulty adapting to or tolerating shift work. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. It's the natural aging process, but also the responsibilities that people have when they get older, their life situation tends to change. Um, and so it's, it's a, a, a constellation of factors that we, ha we haven't been able to tease apart very well. But we know that in general, it becomes harder and harder as you get older to be a, a, a shift worker and actually function well or, or deal with the circumstances. So you, you've been talking to me about the gender differences and the age differences. Um, and some um, family who's doing the caring at home. Um, Andrew, you touched on the health consequences. Um, I'm wondering about what about the, are there safety implications uh, in terms of increased accident risks or not? Is that a myth? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of work in the last few years and I think we now understand that people who work shift work get less sleep people who get less sleep are tired and people who are tired make more mistakes and if that happens in a workplace they can injure themselves or others and I think there's a pretty solid basis for making that conclusion now. I think the interesting thing however has been the tendency in the past to think well the obvious solution to people being fatigued is to make them not fatigued and that somehow we will change their rosters in a way that fatigue will go away as a problem. I think we've matured a little bit in the last decade or two and we've now come to the realisation that if you work 24-7, even if you get a decent sleep, you're always going to be tired at four o'clock in the morning. And I think we're moving from a culture and a safety mentality that says fatigue's a problem let's get rid of fatigue to saying fatigue's a problem how can we get people to work safely whilst fatigued and I think a lot of the development in the last couple of years has been to say let's identify people who are fatigued and then let's rethink about their job and how they do things and who knows they're fatigued so that tired people can deliver health care and emergency services and those um, kind of occupations because frankly the inability to not provide the service politically has meant that people have pretended that fatigue's not a problem and done very little about it. So uh, we're leading into one of the questions that I think will be of great interest to the audience. So it's what can employers be doing in order to um, help accommodate tired workers? If you're saying it's a reality that some workers will need to be working even though they're sleep deprived, and I'm opening it to the whole panel here. Well, from our experience in Australia, and that may not be universal around the world, the biggest and the most important step is to get the organisation to acknowledge that fatigue is a problem. We, we often say that fatigue is a forbidden topic of conversation. Don't mention it because it'll cost us 10% in the next EBA. And our experience has been that once organisations choose to talk about it and see what they can do to manage the risks, a lot of that can be identified and you can develop quite sensible, practical ways to reduce the risk, if not always changing the roster. So, so the I first think, start, step is to start talking about it? Yeah, I think opening the dialogue up and saying fatigue's a problem, let's talk about it, let's share what the silly things people do when they're fatigued and let's see if we can redesign the system so even if people are tired, those mistakes don't necessarily cost lives. So Deanne and Claudia and Hans, what are some of the things that employers can do to be redesigning the system to deal with this reality that some workers will be fatigued? Well, uh, like, like Drew mentions, very important to recognise there's a, a problem, an issue, and to realise that there's no perfect solution. The risk zero do not exist. So first recognise it if you want to manage it properly. And the other message is that one size doesn't fit all. It's a complex problem that needs to be approached by several different directions in order to mitigate its risk uh, properly. And one recommendation may work very well in some environment, for instance, oh, let's try to adjust the body clock of workers to revert to a night-oriented schedule with interventions such as light. It could be okay in some situation, but not at all in others. And uh, 
But there's some general principles such as try to sleep as much as you, you, you can. I think these are, you know, avoid on a daily basis sleep restriction or the buildup of sleep debt as much as you can. But there needs to be some flexibility to accommodate the various uh, situations. So, Hans, some practical suggestions for Australian and international employers about what they can be doing to make uh, work design work better? Yes, yeah, so I think if you go to the working time arrangements that are currently in place and so you start to look at how did they get in to be the way they are, you oftentimes find that they are a complex um, uh, mixture of, 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 of interactions and decisions being made by regulators, by managers and by by employees or, or unions or, or labor and management and regulator uh, triad. And um, and so when you talk about what can employers or what can employees or what can regulators do to help with fatigue in the workplace, you almost uh, always enter that, that triad, that, that, that complex interaction and have to start negotiating that problem from a more holistic point of view. And that can, under certain circumstances, be very um, difficult or controversial to do uh, depending on the on the relationships that employers, employees, and, and regulators have to with each other uh, to begin with. It turns out, however, that if when you start talking about fatigue and you spend a little time with the various different parties that are involved and you start digging, to dig into that topic a little deeper, did you find that at the end of the day, pretty much everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants less fatigue in the workplace, more safety in the workplace, and if possible, also more more productivity. And these things are not orthogonal. So what I found is that to, to, um, to make uh, 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 progress in this area, if you can bring the various parties to the table and, and get them to understand that what they really want is all the same thing and start the dialogue um, from that perspective, then, then it turns out that the working time arrangements and all the complexities that went into them can also be rearranged with a common goal in mind that makes it better for everybody. Maybe not perfect for anybody, because perfect is oftentimes the enemy of the good, but you can make progress and you can make um, uh, improvements. So your point is that consult with everybody, including the workers, and of course in Australian legislation that's actually a requirement. So, um, and... I, I just um, want to add to workers' part, the workers' side, their families. It's very important to involve the, wor the families because the work, it's himself or herself cannot do uh, nothing alone. So it's important to involve the families as well, the employers, the government, the regulators, and the workers. If you start from the regulation, you don't, you will probably not reach the, the workers. And so you need to start together with the workers and their families to support them. And what are some practical things that families can do? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, your comment, Claudia, also raised the concept of shared responsibility. So everybody has a responsibility to manage fatigue correctly. Like, like the, the 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 worker, they should use up their rest days to recover the sleep debt. The manager, they should offer conditions that allow workers to recuperate between the shifts. And the family also, they have to realize, well, I live with a, a shift worker, it has consequences. So when the person wants to rest, you need to protect that risk. And so as part of this process, education is extremely important. <clears throat> and I think all levels of the organization of the family you know, if they can get educated on what are the challenge of working on a typical schedule and what can each of them do, that, that would help tremendously. So I've been hearing over the, the course of this symposium, Drew, about some of the new technologies uh, and interventions that are out there and uh, I wondered if you might talk about some of those and perhaps our other panellists as well. I've heard about things like light therapy or using melatonin. Does any of that work? Is it something that people should be thinking about? Well, I think to come back to Dianne's point is that there are a lot of things that you can do, but it isn't a one-size-fits-all. In fact, it's a one-size-doesn't-fit-most situation. And I think what one of the key messages is that we have seen a shift in the last 10 years. And 
up until about 10 years ago, the primary control mechanism was the roster and discussions around the roster. I think we've seen the emergence of a whole set of new wearable computing, um, in-cab monitoring technologies. There's a whole set of very slick fatigue gadgets, as they have sometimes referred to us. And I think they have enormous potential to help with fatigue, but I'd also raise a cautionary note that often in some organisations they're seen as a silver bullet that's going to solve the whole problem. And to come back to Claudia's point is it takes a family to support a shift worker. And sometimes the appeal of a piece of technology can override the more difficult but more important things that have to be done in terms of the employer's responsibilities, the family and community, the regulators. So I think we're going to see much more sophisticated systems as a result of technology, but I'm also cautious that sometimes they can be very appealing without necessarily having the evidence to support their effectiveness. Deanne and Claudia and Hans, have you got any comments about the new technologies or new techniques that might be useful or a myth that they may help? Well, in my case, I have been studying truck drivers for the past 10 years, and I can say uh, we need to work more on that. We, we, we didn't find a very nice uh, technology to help them to really identify when they are sleepy and what they should do. And I think this is mainly because what they should do is to sleep. And what the employer want, uh, wants is that the truck driver reach that or deliver that goods uh, on time. So this is a kind of uh, controversial situation. And uh, so we need to do these things together, technology and the support of the employer I mean, in order to make the technology work. Yeah, and uh, I, I share the, the same opinion. And if we look at, uh, if we look at, for instance, technology that can predict or evaluate the fitness for duty, I think they, they can create a false sense of security. Let's say, for instance, you, you have a worker who arrive at the start of a night shift. The alertness can be pretty f high and he can be fine at that time but had he known about the circadian the, the 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 way the body clock controls alertness he would know that at that time of day maybe alertness is high but it's gonna dive into uh, low points at the end of the night and the challenge is that these technologies should aid in uh, controlling fatigue at work, but they cannot be the, the solution because uh, when the fatigue levels are, are, are too high, maybe it's too late also. Yeah. So you need to mix education and discussion and have group of, uh, of employees at various levels within the organization and especially higher level management uh, should embark on this uh, fatigue management uh, initiative. I think one of the tricky parts is when you put technology in the hands of people that um, can freely obtain and use it, that you have to be careful about the, the tricky parts of human behavior. Um, there's this anecdotal example of, of uh, truck drivers who have drowsy driving warning systems in their trucks and notice that they are uh, being alerted to be drowsy and they decide that obviously they need to have sleep and therefore they start driving faster to make it home sooner, mm -hmm. which is yes. the exact wrong solution to the exact right identification of a problem. And, and, and so what, as with so many aspects of human behavior, um, we, we know the basic principles, but how it actually plays out in practice is something that continues to be a, a, a topic of research and it's really complicated. So I think we're beginning to run out of time. So I'm just going to ask all of you to give one concluding practical suggestion for our viewers on what a worker or an employer uh, can be doing to actually minimise uh, the, the um, health and safety consequences of fatigue. 
I'm going to go for the cultural one and say it's okay to talk about it and that if we have that dialogue, we should be able to solve the problem and it doesn't always require high-tech solutions. Just knowing that the person you're working with is tired will change the way you observe, interact and regulate their behaviour. And we see that kind of stuff happening in workplaces all the time. So I think there's some very good low-tech solutions that come when people think it's okay to talk about this topic and to share with others when they are fatigued and particularly with their managers and people within the organisation who are responsible for managing the safety of that organisation. So speak up and tell people when you're tired. Yes. Well, I think I, I could say a number of things, but uh, I, I go for the dialogue as well. I think it's more important to uh, think about education programs that can actually be done in companies, with employers and employees and also link this to the research world. I mean, this mean this needs to be uh, close, very close. We need to work together, the university, researchers, the companies and the real world. I think this is the most important thing. Okay. Yeah, I agree with uh, all that is said, and uh, it's important to talk about it, but also to do something about it. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, we're researchers, scientists, we know the problem, we try to transfer the knowledge, but probably the solution will come from the workplace environment. So what do you do with this uh, observation about fatigue? What can be done? What do you do if a worker says, oh, I think I'm too tired, I'm not fit for duty. You need to start thinking ahead of time of alternative scenarios, plan B, uh, B plan, sorry. And, and, and uh, uh, make sure that you are proactive as an organization and have an open dialogue and, and none, you know, make the workers feel that they can discuss that issue and, and that something is going to be done about it. So we tell people, um, people like myself will tell people that it would be really great if you could sleep eight hours and if you could do it in the night and you could have a regular schedule and all those things that in shift work settings are basically pretty much impossible. Um, I think the one piece of advice that I would give is, is be aware of the simple but perhaps not correct solution. Um, we have a, a tendency to ask, just tell me what to do, just tell me how to solve this problem. And um, both from the research perspective and from the organizational perspective, we don't necessarily have all the answers yet, which means that we, don't, we, we cannot necessarily give you a one size fits all answer to those complicated questions. But I would also suggest that sometimes the answer has already been found. Sometimes the answer is already in the organization, in the individuals, they've already come up with a solution to make things work. So is that things like having power naps or having better lighting? Yeah, so, or, yeah, so, so sanctioned napping in the workplaces can be a really good solution. It depends on the workplace. And in some workplaces we find that really works really well. Um, uh, commuting where, where you uh, share rights home um, to increase safety is an example of that. So people have found solutions that can, in their particular circumstances, be just perfectly fine. And I would suggest that, yes, there's always room for improvement, but don't throw overboard the things you've already figured out that actually do work. And maybe uh, you make me think about something which is very important, that people often they keep the model of a day of a norm normal day-oriented schedule as a goal to achieve. Let's say, try to sleep in one single sleep episode and go as close as we can to you know normal behavior. Actually, this can be quite detrimental in some work organization. And the model that you have to sleep in one single period can actually increase fatigue. So it's OK to have split sleep schedule that can actually help you go through your work roster with minimal uh, uh, alertness impairment. And so you have to think outside of the box, basically. So it's more important to get the amount of sleep even if it's not all in one go. Exactly. Thank you very much. Is there anything, some, any concluding comments that you want we, we've heard about 
a little bit of a power napping. I hear this really strong message about the need, there's no silver bullet, it's about getting enough sleep. I hear a really strong message about talking with our workers in the workplace and trying to identify some practical solutions because ship work is with us whether we like it or not. Are there any final concluding comments that you think that we should be um, taking home today? Again, going back to the notion of dialogue, it's very interesting when you go and talk to organisations and say, tell us the dumb stuff you do when you're tired. And just having that conversation so people can then work out how to rework the workplace in ways that stops those errors happening. Healthcare, emergency services, defence are all full of examples of where people, as Hans has pointed out, are already doing things to manage fatigue well but they're not formal elements in the safety management system. And in many cases, they're procedural violations, despite the fact that they're making the place safe. That sounds like that's a topic <laughs> for another conversation, Drew, or perhaps offline. Um, I'd like to say there is not a single solution. Although we are discussing this in an international meeting, uh, there is not a, a solution that can fit every country or all companies, different places, different categories of workers. Uh, we need to understand that it can be different depending according to the case. And this, I think it's the, my final message. Thanks very much. What's the role of the health and safety representative and do they need more information about the health and safety consequences of shift work and long working hours? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And, and, and just like most other um, aspects of running a business, it's an expertise that is required to be a part of the organization to function fully, just like uh, bookkeeping and your engineer and your building manager and all these people that have certain expertise. This is an area of expertise that needs to be brought into an organization that is based on shift work. Um, and um, and so if there is a, a, a person or a department where that has a natural fit, it stands to reason to make sure that these people are educated on the topic and that they can propagate that, that knowledge towards the workforce. Now, I would also submit that it's that uh, uh, obtaining that knowledge is not something you can just do overnight. That requires some training. And as we've already discussed in this panel, there is some research that is starting to evolve, but isn't really sorted out yet. And so I would submit that with Drew having brought together here a, a hundred or so experts in the world, uh, maybe designated uh, people in organizations can start to reach out to, to people like us so that we can then propagate the research and the knowledge base to the organizational officials that they can subsequently translate it to the actual workplace. So I'd just like to, I've heard a question from the audience, which I think is an excellent one, quite a challenging one, is what's the role of your group to actually feed into groups like the ILO uh, in terms to, of informing international conventions on working hours? That's a really difficult question, Peter, and it's, it's the $64,000 question in a sense. One of the challenges is that regulatory agencies around the world often try to come up with a one-size-fits-all solution. And we have enough trouble getting a one-size-fits-all solution in one organisation and one group of workers, let alone something that's going to cover everybody all around the world. So I think the goal of groups like us is to focus people on letting go of prescriptive approaches to legislation. I think promoting performance-based regulatory frameworks is very important. But I'll also make the comment that global and UN-based regulatory bodies are not embracing performance-based regulation or legislation just yet. And I think that's a very slow global process that's going to take decades from its birth in 1972 and the Robins reforms in the UK. I suspect if we come back in 2072, we might start to see that. But I suspect, like most things at a global level, it takes a long time. And I'd be interested in the other's views from different cultures. I think Australia and English-speaking countries in general have pushed very rapidly into the performance-based approaches, especially to fatigue. But I also know in other countries that's not popular 
and I know many other countries where the idea of regulating shift work and fatigue is the least of their problems and they're more worried about a host of other problems before we worry about a few tired shift workers. Yeah, and also to add to Drew's comment, what is important is not only consider the, 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 the work roster, the work shift organization, but also the workload. Because if the workload is low, and the risk associated with being fatigued at work is low, uh, then the work hours can change. And these needs to be taken into consideration. And so arriving with uh, international guidelines that should be followed would, I think, put uh, organization at disadvantage in terms of flexibility and really recognizing uh, and mitigating their own risk. So they have to be adapted to the nature of the task, to the nature of the organization, and, and there needs to be some flexibility. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today in this panel discussion, and uh, uh, I look forward to meeting with you all professionally on another occasion.